8, but tonight we're going to look at uh, chapter 5, continue there in chapter number 5, and uh, we're going to talk about what everyone needs to know about sin. What everyone needs to know about sin. Romans 5, verses 12 through 14 may be very familiar verses to you. I hope they are. Uh, but we're going to look at them closer this evening and, Lord willing, learn something that we didn't know before. Or m- perhaps if we know it, may it be reinforced uh, because repetition makes us remember things. And I, I hope that you will uh, allow the Holy Spirit to open up your heart tonight and help you understand what God has for you personally in this passage. Romans 5 verse 12 says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world. Did you get that? For until the law, sin was in the world. That is, sin was in the world before the law. And it says, But sin is not imputed where there is no law. Sin was there, but it isn't put to your account if you didn't know any better. The law wasn't there, but sin was there. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. It says, Adam was the figure of him who was to come. Do you have any idea who that might be talking about? Jesus. In fact, Jesus is also called the second Adam or the last Adam. But now in order to understand the nature of sin, what everybody needs to know about sin there are four important questions that need to be answered from our text tonight. Uh, the one question is, why does, where does sin come from? The second question is, why do I sin? The third one is, what happens when I sin? And the fourth one is, what is the true remedy for sin? Those are the four questions we'll look at. Number one, Where does sin come from? Now, I'm not going back as far as when Lucifer was cast out of heaven. I'm not going back to that. I'm I'm asking this question in relation to the sin of man. Where does sin come from? When, When did the first sin enter the earth? When did it happen? Well, Paul offers a simple one word answer Adam Adam sin entered the earth through Adam Adam and Eve of course were created by God in innocence they were in absolute innocence they knew no sin they were placed in a paradise a beautiful paradise they were given only one restriction one tree they could not eat from And, of course, that's the very tree that they ate from. And that's when sin entered into the world. When you go way, way, way back to the earliest days of history, to a place called Eden, uh, this paradise where God spoke man into existence and breathed into him the breath of life, and where God said, it's not good that man should be alone, I'll create a helper or a help meet for him, suitable for him. I thought it was not insignificant that the helper that God provided for Adam was a female, not a male. That's very significant. You have one man in the whole universe that God made. And God said, you need a helper. He didn't send Adam another man. Now that's significant. He sent him a woman. 
that was God's plan because he knew that man needed a woman. And so, fellas, anytime you get to thinking that you don't need your wife, you need to remember it was God's idea. It was his idea to bring a woman to a man, not two men. So that's one, that's not even in my notes, it's just an observation we need to look at. He brought her to him because he needed her. Um, he was the one, Adam was, who was given charge over the garden, the paradise. Uh, he was the one who actually named the animals. Those people who believe in evolution, they teach and believe that things started out down here and they evolved and got better and better and better and better. But in reality, can you imagine what kind of a man, or what, rather what kind of a mind Adam must have had to name all the animals that God created? He was a man created in innocence, a man with already some scruples about himself to be able to be over this vast paradise to, to tend it, to water it, to do whatever needs to be done to this garden, and to, to name all the animals that God made. He was the one who named Eve. Adam was. Adam was the head of the first family, the first human family. And God said to Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, And the Lord God took the man... And put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. Wow, that's a wonderful thing. You can eat from any tree in the garden you want. You don't even have to pray about it. You don't have to know what God's permissive will is. His perfect will was, hey, you've got a choice. Eat any tree you want. And then he says, but, you know, sometimes the word but is a good thing and sometimes it's not so good a thing. And in this case, in Adam's mind, evidently it was not a good thing. He says, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. (laughs) Now imagine that. You have an entire paradise to live in. You don't have to worry about working for a living or paying bills. You don't have to worry about clothes. Nothing. You, you just exist and you're in this wonderful garden with this woman that God made for you. And you can eat from any tree in the garden. And only one tree in the garden God said you can't eat. How easy would it be to live without touching that tree? It's very difficult. Because man is very inquisitive. That's just like if you tell a child, you can eat anything on the table except don't eat that Reese cup. You can eat anything as much. (coughs) You can eat as much as you want. You can have two platefuls. You can have milk to drink, tea to drink, whatever. but, But you just can't eat that one Reese cup. I mentioned that the video Sunday, just watching the kids. Uh, if you ever get a chance to look at Americans' Funniest Home Videos on YouTube, uh, the Candy Challenge. Just Google that, the Candy Challenge. Because Mother puts a marshmallow in a plate in front of her kids, two of them. And, and she says, now, you can eat these now or... If you will wait till I come back, you can have two. And so mom walks out of the room and the camera pans in on the kid's face and they're looking at that marshmallow. And it's so comical, but it's such a picture of temptation. It's such a picture because you see those kids touching it and the little boy touches it and then he went. And then the little girl went. She started smelling it. And mom still is, they're going to get two. And then they start talking to each other. Don't eat it. Don't eat it. We'll get two. Don't eat it. And finally the little girl puts her hands down like this. 
and she picks it up and takes one little bite and puts it back down. You're not going to get two, he said. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's hilarious, but then again, it's not because you see how powerful that phrase is. Don't. You can't. And that's exactly the thing that Satan uses. And it's what he used with Eve. He tried to convince Eve that God wasn't fair because he wouldn't let him eat that fruit. But he tried to convince Eve that God was really trying to hide something from them because God knew that if they ate that fruit, they would be like God's. And so he was not being fair with them. Where does sin come from? You would think that Adam would be completely happy, but he's not. He wants one thing that he can't have. He wants the fruit from the forbidden tree. Put in his paradise with every good and perfect tree, the serpent is very subtle. And he went to Eve. Why he went to Eve and not Adam, I don't know. But evidently, Adam was with her. He went to Eve and he tried to um, psychologically convince her that it was okay to eat that piece of fruit. In fact, the Bible says that Eve was deceived. So he deceived Eve. So then Eve gave some to Adam. Now, did Adam hear God say, don't eat that? He absolutely did. And Adam ate that fruit. And so the difference is that Eve was deceived by the subtle Satan, but Adam outright sinned against God. That's why God came to Adam in the garden. He said, Adam, where art thou? And that's when Adam and Eve start to cover themselves and hide from God, as if you could really hide from God. But uh, that is when, when Adam deliberately sinned, that is when what theologians call the fall of man occurred. The fall of man. That means that when Adam ate the fruit, he fell from a state of innocency into a state of guilt. He fell from grace to judgment. He fell from life to death. I've often wondered, had Adam and Eve not sinned in the garden, would they still be living now? As we'll see later, the results of sin, the consequences of sin, is death. So would they have died had they not taken that forbidden fruit? Uh, by one man, sin entered into the world. Who was that? Adam. It wasn't Satan. It was Adam that sinned against God. He, he sinned against a known command. Now, Eve also suffered consequences because of her actions. I wonder what would have happened if Adam had held his ground... And told his wife, don't eat that. Don't you know God told us not to eat that? I wonder if Adam had been um, a leader in the home rather than a passive weenie. I wonder if things would have turned out different. We'll never know. By one man, sin entered into the world. There's no way to explain the world apart from the fall. How do you explain these mass shootings? Well, it's the gun's fault. Take the guns off the street. Well, what about the stabbings? Oh, it's the knife's fault. Take the knives off the street. What about the people that are bludgeoned to death with hammers? Take the hammers off the street. Then the carpenters can't build anything. It isn't the hammers. It's the people. It's the heart. It's the fact that every person that you know is a sinner. Every person you know. How do you explain hatred, greed, violence, competition, injustice, fraud, 
killing? Where does it all come from? What makes us hate one another? Why, why, why can't we seem to change as a, um, as a people? You would think as far as we've come along, you know, in these modern days we're living, where you have computers that uh, have artificial intelligence and they can basically decide what you're going to choose, uh, where you have robots that can do the job of people, It's amazing the technology that's available today. And yet man has still never come to the place where he could cure everyone in prison. You know why? Because of Adam. Adam brought sin into the world. Listen to what Donald Barnhouse says about this, the doctrine of the original sin is what it's called. Men hate the doctrine of original sin and seek to deny its existence, but it still stands. They substitute the theory of ascent for the doctrine of descent, but the fall still confronts them. Even if they could sweep away the indestructible revelation of God, their very deeds expose man's sinfulness. And if men deny the existence of their senses, their own hearts proclaim kinship to death, which envelops all the race, Apart from the doctrine of the fall, there's no explanation for the course of human history. If the first three chapters of Genesis were destroyed, the facts of history would demand that they be rewritten to account for all that has followed since the day when man turned away from God and lost the image in which he was created. Our text stands secure by one man, sin, entered into the world. So to answer the question... Where did sin come from? What's the answer? It was Adam's fault. That's where it started. Created in innocence, and yet he still chose to disobey a direct order from his creator. That's sin. A definition of sin is anything that we think, say, or do that's against our creator that displeases our creator, that sin. So you can not only sin in action, you can sin in inaction also. When you fail to do what you know you should do, what God has led you to do, then that too is sin. So we come to the next question. Why do I sin? Me. Why do I sin? Ask yourself that. Why do you sin? Now don't say I don't sin. Because if you say you don't sin, the Bible says you're a liar and the truth's not in you. Either you're lying or you deceive yourself into thinking that you don't sin. We're no longer talking about Adam now. We're talking about you and your life this week. Why do you sin? Why do you repeatedly choose to do wrong? Well, you sin... Because you have a sin nature. That is, you were born with this inner inclination towards sin. Paul says it like this in verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, that's Adam, and death by sin, it says, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. All have sinned, past tense. All have sinned. Not all sin, though that's true. Or not all are sinners. That's also true. The way it's worded there, all have already sinned. All. This verse is pushing you and me back to the Garden of Eden. Back to that day, that moment when Adam ate that forbidden fruit. And in some way, you and I were there. In some strange way, when Adam sinned, you sinned, and so did I. And that's called the doctrine of the original sin in its plainest form. It means that when Adam sinned, you sinned. When Adam disobeyed, you disobeyed. When Adam fell, you fell. When Adam died, you died. Spiritually, you died. 
To say it another way, although you and I were not historically there in the garden, because we are descendants of Adam, we're descendants of Adam in his family tree, then we suffer the consequences of what he did. In fact, we're all in the Adam family. We are descendants of the first man, Adam. When Adam was created, he stood as the divinely appointed representative for the whole human race. He was the only one. Then Eve Eve came along. They were the only human family. Now, do you believe that? Really? You mean there wasn't some other people somewhere in the world that they didn't know about because they didn't have the internet, they couldn't see across the world? Were they truly the only people on the planet? I believe they were. Do you? Well, the Bible says they were. So if my authority is the Bible, then I have to believe that they were the only two people in the whole world. Therefore, they were the representatives of the entire human race, were they not? And if I am their descendant, that means I get what I inherit from them, what they pass down. And Adam passed down this sin nature. All of us trace our lineage back to him, back to Adam. He and Eve are the progenitors, the founders of the entire human race. So when Adam sinned, he represented us and we were truly present in him because we are directly descended from him. So when he was created, he represented us. When he was in the garden, he represented us. And when he ate the fruit, he represented us. And when he was cast out of the garden, he represented us. What happened to him, therefore, really and truly happened to us. As one preacher put it, Adam was the driver of the bus of humanity. When he drove the bus over the cliff, we went down with him. Every person is born with a tendency, a drive to do wrong. We're born with a sin nature. And it's easy to see that in little children, especially little children. Nobody teaches their children to do wrong. If you do, you're a terrible parent. But children just naturally do wrong, don't they? They naturally rebel against what you tell them to do. It, it, you know, if they don't want to do it, they don't do it. I love to watch children around parents. I really, truly do. Uh, I was sitting in Chick-fil-A the other day for lunch. And, I mean, I almost started crying watching this family. This was a, a young family. They're probably in their mid-20s, okay, husband and wife. And they've got four children in the same booth. They've got a baby sitting up here in a little uh, car seat thing. Looked to be like a few months old. And then they had a little girl over here, and she reminded me of Lydia. And then they had two other boys, uh, one in a high chair and one next to his mama over there. And I was watching those kids, and they were being so good for their mom and dad. And the parents were being good. The, the dad picked the baby up and was cuddling the baby so that the mom could eat. And when I watched him, I said, man, time sure does fly. It sure does fly. Because I remember when ours were little like that. And it's like overnight. They're adults. One of them has his own kids. I thank the Lord for kids. But if kids don't have parents that give them instruction, they will not turn out the way they want them to. Want them to. Consider this. These are some words. I found this on the front of a, um, a website that was dedicated to families. And uh, they were the words written in the 1926 Minnesota Crime Commission. This is what they said. 1926, every baby starts life as a little savage. He is completely selfish and self-centered. He wants what he wants when he wants it. His bottle, his mother's attention, his playmate's toy, his uncle's watch. Deny him these wants and he seethes with rage and aggressiveness 
which would be murderous were he not so helpless. He is dirty. He has no morals, no knowledge, no skills. This means that all children, not just certain children, are born delinquent. If permitted to continue in the self-centered world of his infancy, given free reign to his impulsive actions to satisfy his wants, every child would grow up a criminal, a thief, a killer, a rapist. My, how far we've come. Now we're living in a society that wants to give children the rights over their parents to say what sex they are. My, how far we've come. If you raise a child with no restrictions, you're going to raise a criminal. Because if you won't discipline your children, society will. Because all sinners, all children are sinners. They're born that way. You were born that way. We're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. Our basic nature is corrupt and depraved. We're like little savages. It's a natural thing for us to do wrong. Every child would be blessed to have a parent who is willing to be brave and to be unpopular to tell that child when he's wrong. To tell that child when, when his friends are wrong. To teach them while they're young boundaries. I always said children are like little security guards. Now, I've been a security guard for years. Security guards have to check doors. I used to work at Chattanooga State. We had to check every single door in that complex every night. It had to be chain wrapped, locked. And, and what you did not want is to find one open. Because that meant maybe somebody was in the building. One night, it was probably 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. I was walking in the gym. And they had a science lab upstairs in that building. And, and I walked upstairs and I saw a light on, 3 o'clock in the morning. I wasn't even allowed to put lights on. I had to use a flashlight. I saw that, and so I crept up quietly. I didn't have a firearm. I had a wad of keys. They said, hit them with the keys. So I had my keys holding them tightly so they wouldn't make a noise. And I went around the corner. And well, the labs was open, the door was open, the light was on. I didn't see anybody in there, so I, I, I went back toward the back of the room, and there was another door there, and it was cracked, and the, door, the light was on, and that little storage room there. And so I went in there, I opened the door like this. There was a, there was a cat that they were using to dissect. They had boxes of them. And this cat was on top of the box like this. And I jumped back about three feet. But, you know, I wanted the door to be closed. But it wasn't closed. And it made me feel insecure. And here's what children do. They test every door. They try every single door. And what they're really hoping is that the door's locked. Because when they have free course, they feel insecure. So they look for security somewhere else. They look for it in gangs, somebody that's got their back. That's one thing that's appealing, especially kids that have no parents. They find a family in a gang. Even though they're doing terrible things, it's still a family. They get mutual support there. They know that, that the other guys have their back if somebody tries to hurt them. Parents and grandparents, we need to be there for our kids and grandkids and, and, and make sure that we're the same every time and that we set the boundaries and we don't change because they whine 
or because they say, I don't like you anymore. And that's another message. I didn't mean to go there. But children are sinners by nature, and you're a sinner by nature. So here's the next question. What happens when I sin? That is, what's the ultimate result of my sin? Where does sin ultimately lead? And the answer is very simple. Verse 12 tells us, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, that's Adam, and death by sin. Death by sin. Ultimately, sin leads to death. And when I sin, I die. Every time I sin, I die a little bit more. Another version translates that verse. Sin entered the world through one man and death through sin. And in this way, death came to all men because all sinned. First there was sin, then there was death. Notice three things he says about sin in verses 12 and 14. Death comes through sin. Death comes to all men. And death reigned from Adam to Moses. In verse 14, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, or the same way Adam sinned, who is the figure of him that was to come. What does this mean? It means that even before God gave the Ten Commandments, men sinned and they died because of their sin. Death has always been the result of sin. You can go go all the way back to Genesis chapter 5. That's where you find the first genealogy in the Bible. And it gives us the generations from Adam to Moses. And each one ends in the same words. And he died. Adam lived and he died. Seth lived and he died. Enosh lived and he died. Kenan lived. And he died, and so on across the generations, only one exception. You know who it was? Enoch. Enoch walked with God. Uh, he, he didn't die. The point is, men died because they were sinners even without the Ten Commandments. They didn't even know the Ten Commandments, and yet they still died because of what? Sin. Sin was in the world before the law. They just didn't know it was sin, but it still killed them. Because the wages of sin is death. But death still reigns today. If you don't believe it, just open the newspaper. Y'all remember what those are? And look at the obituaries and just read them. Every time I read the obituaries, I leave that session being thankful because my name's not there. But you see people your age... You see people a lot younger than you are. And it's just a constant reminder when you see obituaries that it is appointed that a man wants to die. Why? Because all men are sinners. So when you die one day, and you will, the coroner will fill out a death certificate for you. And at the bottom of that certificate, there's a phrase that says, cause of death. If we understand the Bible correctly, the answer is always the same. Sin. Not sickness, not cancer, not a car accident, not old age. Those are just symptoms of what killed us. Sin is what killed us. So finally we ask the question, the most important question, what is the remedy for my sin? Verses 15 to 17 You have to read this slowly. Paul is kind of wordy. You might have noticed that. Uh, He's just brilliant. Sonia and I were talking the other night. We were reading uh, Romans. Uh, That's where we are in our our reading. And I said, you know, he has such a vocabulary. He was, uh, I mean, just, I realized that he was writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but the way he put words together was amazing. But there's, there, sometimes you have to read it slowly. Verse 15, but not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if the, through the offense of one, many be dead. Who's that? 
Adam, through his offense, it says many are dead, because the wages of sin is death. Much more, the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation. But the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. The answer is simple. What's the remedy for my sin? A gift. The gift. It's mentioned five times. In verses 15 to 17, the word, the gift. What gift is he talking about? Salvation. Salvation By faith in Jesus Christ. Paul gives four definitions of that gift. He calls it a gift of God. It's a gift that God gave us. For God so loved the world that he what? Gave It's a gift of grace, verse 17. Grace is a word that means unmerited. Unmerited favor. It's kind of interesting. You know the word grace and the word gift are translated from the same Greek word? I saw a young lady's name this week. Her name was um, Grace Caris. Don't remember her last name. But I caught the Grace Caris. What really they were saying is that Grace, grace. But what the parents meant was grace, a gift. Grace, a gift. But it's the same thing. It's it's a salvation is by grace and it's a gift. And then it's called the gift of righteousness. And that's referring back to what we've already studied. We don't receive a righteousness that we produce because we don't have it within us to produce righteousness. We can't make ourselves good. Uh, On our very best day, we can't. So it must be a gift given to us freely. And then it's a gift of eternal life. Chapter 6, verse 23. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's even simpler than that. Verse 15 says that this gift, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, it says, hath abounded unto many. Did you get that? It comes through one man, Jesus Christ. God's gift of eternal life comes to you through one man. And his name is Jesus. How do you get that gift? Well, how do you get any gift? There's only two things you can do with a gift. Only two. You can either receive it or you can reject it. There's no middle ground. You either receive it or you reject it. You say, well, I, I want to think about it a little while. Well, when you say that, and you can think about it a little while, but while you're thinking about it, you're rejecting it. That's rejecting it. And when we stand before God one day, whether or not we enter heaven will be determined not based upon how good we've been on earth. It will be based simply on the fact that we received the gift of God in salvation that was bought by one man and his name is Jesus. So the whole message comes down to one simple question. Have you ever accepted God's free gift of salvation that comes through the one man, Jesus Christ? Doesn't come in church membership, doesn't come in baptism, doesn't come in good works. Doesn't mean that you're a, you know have high moral standing. Every individual that you know must at one time or another in their life personally receive a gift of salvation given to them by God. Has nothing to do with how many beads that they pray through on their rosary. Has nothing to do with how many Hail Marys they say for the priest. Doesn't matter how many churches they join or how many good works they perform or how many poor people that they feed. It has everything to do with that simple thing. That's why it's so complex for people. They can't conceive that it's, it can be that simple. 
Salvation is simple. It's receiving the gift of God through Jesus Christ. It's placing your confidence and your trust in what Jesus did on the cross to be sufficient to save you from your sin. Because all of us are sinners. I'm not even talking about the condemnation that we should get because of our sins. I'm talking about the gift. It's available to everyone. So and if you're listening by li- uh, via live stream t- t- tonight, or, or perhaps if you've never made that decision yet, let me challenge you with this. If, God forbid, you die tonight and you find yourself in hell, you cannot blame Adam. You have no one but yourself to blame because a gift was offered to you by one who loves you more than you love yourself and you chose not to receive it. It's as simple as that. So what will you do with the gift of God? What will you do with it? I hope and I pray that you receive it. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your love for us and for not just talking about it, but for showing us when you sent Jesus to die for us on the cross of Calvary to provide a kind of righteousness that we could no longer, we could never produce ourselves. Because we are born sinners. We sin every single day by choice. And we deserve condemnation because of it. Because the wages of sin is death. And everyone in this room and everybody who is watching by live stream on the computer right now, everyone will one day die. And after we die, the Bible says there's the judgment. And the judgment will not be to determine where we spend eternity. The judgment will be what kind of punishment we receive. For those who have accepted this gift, the judgment seat of Christ means a reward. Rewards for what we've done for Jesus. For those who have not received the gift of salvation, judgment means condemnation through all eternity in a lake of fire that God created for Satan and his angels. I pray that if someone is watching and they need to receive this gift, that right where they are, they would kneel before you and say, thank you, Lord, for giving me a gift that I couldn't earn. I know I'm a sinner. I sin all the time. I mess up. Even when I want to do right, I mess up. And I'm very sober to think that because of my sin, I will die and ultimately go to hell. But I want to thank you tonight that you made a way for me to have eternal life. And to have my sins forgiven by sending Jesus, your son, to be my substitute to die for me on the cross of Calvary. And today, I believe, I trust what he did to be sufficient, to save my soul. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. And if you pray that prayer, reach out to us. Let us know so we can pray for you, so we can be here to support you, to be a family that you deserve to be in. I pray you would help us who are here tonight to go out from this place and be excited about this message of salvation, this gift to be so excited that we want to share it with everybody we know. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.